Hey guys, Scott here and welcome to a Dead by Daylight guide on how to not be a bad killer. This is going to be kind of as vague as possible to not go into actual killer specifics, just overall, you know, strategy and mind games that can work on all killers. Because as soon as I start going into specifics, well then I gotta make like 11 more guides for all the killers and then it gets... That's... That's a lot of stuff. So, without further ado, this tutorial is going to be explained in the order an actual game would go, so let's start with the very first part, your perks. First off, barbecue and chili. This is the one perk every single killer other than like a tombstone Myers can benefit from. Double blood points aside. For those who don't know how it works, barbecue and chili reveals all survivors outside of a 40 meter radius whenever a survivor is hooked. The amount of information this gives is ridiculous, like see here. So with just my first hook, I know that there's a guy on a generator in a jungle gym, I know that there's someone behind the hill over here, and I also know that there's somebody that's close to me because they didn't appear with barbecue and chili. This means I know what everybody is doing, the guy that's close to me is going to go for the save, the guy on the generator is going to continue working on the generator, and the guy on the hill is probably going to either make his way to that generator or hide once he hears my humming in the distance. Barbecue and chili lets you master one of the most important things a killer can do, which is map control. Since I know where everybody is, I control everything. So the guy that's near me is going to come from the save, he's not on a generator, the guy behind the hill is not on a generator, and if I go for the guy that is on a generator, now nobody on the entire team is doing anything to progress the game towards the end. So I don't even have rune and nothing is being done just because I know where to go, all because of barbecue and chili. Next up for perks is Whispers. Whispers is another perk that just about every killer in the game can benefit from. I used to think Whispers wasn't that great because if you're constantly around survivors, this, you know, it doesn't really actually do anything. But I have uh, since learned the error of my ways. Whispers is downright unmatchable when it comes to tracking, once you learn how to use it correctly. So Whispers simply lights up and lets you know if you're within 32 meters of a survivor. That's all it does. It doesn't grow brighter when you're closer or fall dimmer when further away. It's just like a boolean yes or no. However, the amount of time this saves is so important. It is most useful at the start of a game for finding the first survivor, also it's good, you know, at the end of the game for finding the last survivor, but some would argue that's not enough to justify a perk slot, you know, just to find one guy at the beginning and one guy at the end. However, you have to think about how incredibly useful quickly finding a survivor is. If you start the game, run to an area, and whispers pops up, several things happen. First, the survivor is now in your terror radius, well, for most killers. This means they'll hear your heartbeat and will instinctively go into hiding. Most players will hide when they hear the heartbeat within 30 seconds of the game starting because they're usually not in a particularly defensible position as they just spawned in. Now once a survivor has found like a generator in say a jungle gym, they'll feel more comfortable and won't necessarily go anywhere when they hear a heartbeat, which is why funding, or finding someone as soon as the match starts is so crucial. So like I said first off, the survivor is in your terror radius and you know there is a survivor within that radius. Next, depending on the location the survivor spawned, they'll most likely try to hide. There's no reason for them to not try and hide unless there's a dead giveaway they're nearby, like, you know, a generator that's just been started. A hiding survivor is generally easier to get a first hit on, or an instant down if you're a killer that has one, because they're not actively running away or pallet looping you, which is when survivors are at their strongest. Initiating a chase within the first 15 seconds of the game disables a survivor from doing generators and looking for a totem, you know, looking for hex rune, and while also it clears pallets to make future chases easier. Now once you've downed the survivor, you can then locate other survivors with barbecue and chili and the cycle repeats. This is the strength of whispers, it places you in the cycle of hooking and searching with barbecue and chili, and the start of the cycle is just as important as keeping it going. Enduring is the next perk that almost all killers can benefit from, except nurse. If you have to choose between enduring and brutal strength, always, always go with enduring. Enduring simply reduces the duration of stuns by 75%, which means it only comes into use when being stunned by a pallet or stunned by decisive strike. However. Every game has pallets, and let's be honest, every game has a decisive strike, so you will always benefit from Enduring no matter what kill you are, again, except Nurse. Nurse is bullshit. The reason Enduring is so useful is because it removes all fear of pallets from you as the killer. It's like a pretty ongoing meme to just swing through the pallet to counter pallet looping, but it's kind of a meme born from truth. If you don't swing through pallets and just stop because you're terrified of a piece of wood, a good survivor will run your ass around over and over again, keeping the same pallet up for longer than it should be up. Now most maps don't really have infinite pallets anymore since the whole double pallet nerf. The game has come a long way from what it used to be. Now there are still ridiculous maps like Bad and Preschool and Torment Creek, but most maps are generally pretty serviceable if you don't fear pallets. With Enduring, you remove all potential for mind games from good survivors. You swing through every pallet. The absolute worst thing that happens is you don't hit the survivor and you get stunned for a very short amount of time. Well, who cares? You lost no time, the pallet's dead, and the survivor gets points. Everyone's happy. It's a win-win situation every time. 
Additionally, if the pallet was unsafe, which means the pallet was not actually required to be destroyed in order to continue chasing in an effective manner, enduring makes the unsafe pallet even more scary because you're immediately back on the survivor by just running around it. Enduring also heavily reduces the stun from Decisive Strike, which could be the difference between the survivor getting to another pallet loop or going down like 6 seconds later, which is always hilarious. To me, those are the three starter perks that can work on every killer in the game. Now that last slot starts to depend on the killer, and some killers can actually go without Enduring. Other good perks on almost all killers include Nurse's Calling, Hex Rune, Brutal Strength, and Tinkerer. And that obviously Tinkerer has got to be on killers that can benefit from Tinkerer. Now, in the spirit of making sense and going in order, let's go over various techniques as they would occur normally during a match. First things first, you spawn in. You know, take note of where you are. If you're near a corner of the map, it's a safe bet to head in the opposite corner due to survivor spawning locations never being near the killer, unless some horrible bug happens. I've seen it before, but it's rare. Next, use whispers to quickly find a target. This is the first thing that you should do. For example, here I am spawning in Curtis Brand Asylum. I'm going to find where the opposite end of the map is and just run toward it. It doesn't really matter which side, because there's probably going to be survivor within whispers radius in one of these areas. So, I see right here I have no whispers on. So, this is how useful whispers is. This saves me so much time because I know they're not in the asylum to my right, because that's within 32 meters. I know they're not in that jungle gym to my left, because that's also within 32 meters. So, I don't have to check those two spots. I can just keep walking forward and eventually I keep walking forward and Whispers lights up. So now here, I can see, well, he's not in that corner of the map because that's within 32 meters, so he can't be there. He's not at the jungle gym, and he's not in the asylum, so the shack is to my right. He's probably at the shack, so I'm going to go there. And I move forward a little bit more. I hear a generator now, and there's a guy. So within 15 seconds of the match starting, I've already found a guy, and since I'm Huntress, I can have the man down in, you know, five seconds because Huntress is really good at downing people once you find them. And just like that, the cycle has started. Now I'm going to hook this guy, I'm going to barbecue and chili to the next people, and I'm just going to keep this cycle up over and over again. So I hook the first guy, and then I use barbecue and chili to get knowledge about the other survivors. I see two survivors. One is hidden on this gen here, and one is behind a hill. That means the other one is close enough, and they're probably in the asylum to my right. But whatever, I mean, the match just started. It's not like I have to defend someone on the hook that fast. So I'm going to go towards these two guys over here. Now, the guy on the generator is in a jungle gym, so he's a bit harder to get. The guy on or hiding behind the hill is a much easier target. You always, always want to go for the easier target. Now, that doesn't mean be a dick and tunnel the guy off hook or anything like that. But if you're presented with two options, obviously you're going to want to go for the target that, you know, has less resistance overall. Now, I walk up to the hill and I'm trying to find the survivor and this brings me to the next point which is something that a lot of killers don't do well but just use your ears man your ears are so i don't understand how killers some people play this game listening to like music and stuff sound is so so important in dead by daylight for example if i didn't hear this little piece of grass just listen if I didn't hear that to my left, I would have had to go to the guy in the jungle gym and, you know, he probably would have ran me around some walls I couldn't throw over. He would have looped me for, you know, maybe 30, 40 seconds before I'd actually down him. However, because I heard that slight little clench of grass there, I'd heard that there was a, a Feng Min right behind me and she was a much easier target because she's in the middle of nowhere. So she goes down much quicker. Using your ears is so, so important in this game. Now, it's not always easy to hear. Sometimes you're breaking a pallet with chase music, but if you still pay attention, even here you can hear a Fangman behind me just making a slight, slight noise on your right headphone. And you just gotta be always, always paying attention to that kind of stuff. It will definitely save you a lot of time and get you a lot more kills because people that are that close and not actively in a chase, they're usually hiding and they're much easier to down. However, even with perfect conditions, you're gonna get looped around stuff. This is just inevitable. Again, unless your nurse nurse is bullshit. So, so many people think pallet looping is overpowered and go so far as to, like, face camp people for doing it. To which I respond, what the fuck else are the survivors supposed to do? Just run in a straight line and immediately die? It's their only option! Like, seriously, just go to the Steam forums and type pallet looping and just look at, like, the... What are these people... If killers could break pallets before the pallet is you- WHAT?! Like, just go to, like, some of these- I don't understand what people are thinking, like, what are the survivors supposed? Looping is a crutch for bad survivors that can't break- What does it even mean?! The thing is, most pallet loops aren't just black and white circles you have to run around like a train stuck in its tracks. Most have some level of possible mind game involved. 
Proper use of line of sight is what separates a good killer from a great killer in terms of getting looped. For example, here against the Feng Min, I kept chasing like a relatively straight fashion until the moment I got out of her line of sight and then I quickly switched directions. It only gives me a few more feet in terms of closing distance, but it's enough to get a hit on this tree. Fucking auto-aim. A more advanced technique known as moonwalking can be used to great effectiveness on certain tiles. Now moonwalking is basically just walking backwards around a wall as to hide the giant red light that all killers emit from the front. To effectively moonwalk, you want to be maybe half a loop's distance away from the survivor. Now as soon as they break line of sight around a wall, you immediately start walking backwards through the same loop in the opposite direction. If done correctly, the survivor will still think you're behind them when in fact you're right in front of them, usually meeting at where the pallet is on the other side. You should have enough time to hit them at least once. However, sometimes there's just no room for mind games. Sometimes you just have to run around like a robot while the survivor watches you slowly get closer to them. The thing is, there is still plenty of room for efficiency at these loops, and while you can't exactly outsmart survivors here, you can still be better than most by paying attention to a few things. First off, rounding corners. I can't tell you how many inexperienced killers don't know how much rounding corners a bit too wide hurts them. A slightly wider turn around a corner can be the difference between a survivor getting to a pallet or not. Now this isn't exactly rocket science, but it's something you should always pay attention to. Always hug the walls of the loop as tightly as possible. Over the course of a loop or two, this can bridge a gap more than you'd think, causing the loop to end sooner. Next, and probably most importantly, don't respect pallets. Yes, it's a meme to just swing through the pallet to counter pallet looping. Yes, it's also completely true. Whenever you swing through a pallet, one of four things happens. One, you hit the survivor who didn't drop the pallet because they thought you'd respect it. Two, you hit the survivor and they drop the pallet, but they dropped it a bit too late, so they get hit. Three, the survivor drops the pallet early and you get stunned and nothing happens. Finally, advanced survivors will probably pause as if to drop the pallet, but then they'll continue running, baiting out a swing while also saving the pallet for another loop. So for the first scenario in which you get the hit, great, keep going. In the second scenario, if the pallet is safe, break it and keep going. If it's unsafe, run around it and continue chasing the now injured survivor. In the third scenario, or pre- you know, the previous step, except their full health. In the final scenario, there's a trick to avoid this altogether. Just don't lunge at pallets from a distance, just basic swing while you're right on top of them. It can cover the distance between where the prompt, you know, to actually throw down the pallet shows up and the survivor, while also letting you wait till the very last moment to see if the survivor is actually just going to fake it and keep running, at what point you just don't swing. And yes, yeah, some maps are awful and there's just nothing you can do about it. If you are Wraith on Bad and Preschool or Torment Creek and you're going against good survivors, you're probably just going to lose and there's nothing you can do about it. That's my advice, just, just deal with it. You're not supposed to win every game. Sometimes you get a shit map that hasn't been, you know, fixed yet and there's just nothing you can do. Just you're going to lose and it's out of your control. Now obviously, you know, Nurse and Hillbilly and Huntress can probably still deal with these maps, but most of the cast, when they get, you know, the really bad maps, there's nothing you can do. You're going to get looped and this is where people feel really powerless because you are. But that's really the majority. There's really only like four maps that are insanely bad. The rest are, you know, kind of bad, but they're manageable if you play right. Now, I'm trying to be as unspecific as possible here. In a lot of these examples I've given, the killer actually has an ability to deal with getting looped. Nurse has bullshit, Hillbilly can fake the chainsaw and continue running through a pallet, while also breaking the pallet faster if he has add-ons. Hunters can throw over the pallet and even over some loops entirely. Trapper and Hag and trap loots, you know, etc. I'm just trying to lay down the basics assuming you were a very basic M1 killer like Wraith. In truth, it's actually easier to deal with looping with half the killers in the game. Next, as you can see in this footage, let's talk about flashlights. I love flashlights. Of all the items I can see survivors bring into a trial, I would pick four flashlights every single time. The thing is, brand new parts can't really be countered, instant heals can't really be countered, but flashlights, when handled properly, counter themselves. It's like a built-in hex room where you have a team of four flashlights because you know as soon as you injure someone, they're all going to swarm like locusts to your position to get their sick, nasty flashlight save, which means no one's really doing anything. In this game, you're watching the entire team six seconds swap to flashlights, and this was during the patch where flashlights guaranteed a drop even if you screw up the timing. And yet, I had no problems whatsoever. So here's how to actually deal with a whole team of flashlights. First, never, ever immediately pick someone up once you down them. If you do that without observing your surroundings, you deserve to have the survivor get out of your grasp. Now, if there's a wall nearby, just vacuum pick up the survivor while facing the wall, and this has no counter. They can't do anything about that. Now, if there's no wall nearby, you still have options. The first is the pickup fake. You walk up to the down survivor, pause a second, and then immediately turn around and kind of rush forward. Almost every single time, you'll see one of these three musketeers gunning forward to get their save. 
Now you have one survivor on the ground, and you're immediately in, you know, almost melee range of another survivor. So now a third survivor has to go in and save the first guy who's logging on the ground while you chase the second survivor, which means no one's really doing shit to progress the game anymore. This is what I meant when I said having four flashlight users is like having a built-in hex rune. And don't be afraid of slug in this situation. The survivors will either get back on generators and eventually stop trying to flashlight save every single time, or they'll continue to suicide into each other and eventually bleed out. In this game, they chose the latter option. Also, consider running Franklin's Demise if you're evil or Lightborn to screw with the heads of flashlight users. If you have Lightborn, you can even pick a survivor up in the open with someone else near as long as you turn around before you pick them up. As long as they're not literally right in front of you when you start the pickup animation, Lightborn gives enough resistance to avoid the blind. Just be sure to immediately look up or down. Also, something to practice is knowing when it is actually a good idea to slug, flashlights being a great example. Slugging is just, you know, leaving survivors on the ground instead of immediately picking them up. Now, you don't want to just find your first survivor, down them, and then just leave them there. That's not even efficient. However, if you have a situation in which maybe you have someone on a hook and you down someone trying to rescue that person, well, now you have two people in the exact same spot, which means their remaining teammates will have to be there sooner, they basically lose. This is an example of when it would be smart to actually slug someone. This is more of a broad common sense thing though, so it's kind of a bit harder to give exact examples of when you should leave survivors on the ground. Another little thing you can do that's really simple and doesn't really require any practice is like little mini moonwalking. Basically if there's a survivor behind an object, like even a small rock and you know where they are, just approach one side and then backtrack and immediately go towards the other, because as soon as you approach one side they're going to leave and the other side. So. This saves you, you know, just even a couple of seconds, but a couple of seconds, I mean, the whole game is time efficiency, so a couple of seconds saved is really, really useful. That's really kind of the basics of what I can cover without going into killer specifics. Now, the killer specifics do change things a lot. You know, for example, if someone goes around, like, the cow tree and you're wraith, that is a nightmare. If they go around cow tree and you're, like, huntress, you can actually cut off a lot of their, you know, their uh, vaults, so it's not nearly as bad. So, it's kind of hard to make a guide like this while being as vague as possible, um, but any more specific and I start getting into what you should do with individual killers, and that is a time for another guide. So, I hope you enjoyed, uh, you know, this stuff. You can tell this part was not pre-written because I'm stumbling on a lot of words, but um, I hope you guys enjoyed watching it, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the uh, comments or join my stream and ask then. But uh, that should be it. Take it easy, guys.